In July of 1884, Don Bosco had a dream which revealed many ways to safeguard the virtue of purity. It's very valuable information for all Catholics. The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. When Don Bosco started to dream, he seemed to see before him an enchanting and immense green slope. At the foot of it, a meadow formed that was equivalent to a low step from which one could jump off onto the little path where Don Bosco was standing. All around, it looked like an earthly paradise, magnificently illuminated by a light that was brighter and purer even than that of the sun. It was covered all around by green vegetation, star-spangled by a thousand different kinds of flowers and shaded by an infinite number of trees, whose branches intertwined, stretching out like immense festoons. In the center of the garden and stretching to its further border was a carpet of magic candor, so dazzling that the eyes were blinded. It was several miles wide, as magnificent as royal pomp. Don Bosco uses words like candor or candid in this dream to mean brilliant, white, or pure. So just keep that in mind as we go forward. Several inscriptions in golden letters ornamented the border, encircling it. On one side it read, Beati Immaculati in Via, qui ambulant in lege domini. Blessed are they who pass through life's journey unstained, who follow the law of the Lord. On the other side it read, To innocent lives he will never refuse his bounty. On the third was written, They will not be dismayed by adversity. In time of famine they will be well content. On the fourth side, Jealously the Lord watches over the lives of the guiltless. They will hold their lands forever. Then in the middle of the carpet was written this last one, He that walketh sincerely shall be saved. In the middle of the slope, on the higher side of the brilliant carpet, there stood a shining banner, on which was written in letters of gold, Son, thou art always with me, and all I have is thine. Though Don Bosco was enchanted by the garden, his attention was drawn to two lovely little maidens, who were about twelve years old, and who were sitting at the edge of the carpet, where the slope formed a low step. Their whole gracious demeanor emanated a heavenly modesty. One didn't only perceive the innocent simplicity of a dove in their eyes that gazed steadily upward, but also a most pure, fervent love and a joyful, heavenly happiness. Their broad, serene brows seemed to harbor candor and sincerity, while a sweet, enchanting smile hovered on their lips. Their features denoted tender, ardent hearts, and the graceful movements of their bodies conferred a dignity and nobility on them that contrasted oddly with their youth. A pure white garment fell to their feet, and no stain, wrinkle, or even speck of dust was apparent on it. Their long hair, forming a shadow in its thickness and falling in curled ringlets over their shoulders, was covered by a crown. They were talking with each other. They took turns to speak, asking each other questions and issuing exclamations. They would both sit, or one sat while the other stood, or they would stroll together, but they never stepped off the candid carpet or touched either the grass or the flowers. Don Bosco stood there like a spectator in his dream without speaking to the little maidens, and they didn't seem to be aware of his presence. One of them addressed the other in a harmonious voice, What is innocence? The happy condition of sanctifying grace preserved by constant observance of the divine commandments. The other girl answered in a voice that was no less sweet, The purity of innocence preserved is the source and origin of all knowledge and virtue. The first maiden said, How splendid, how glorious, how magnificent is the virtue to live honestly among those who are evil, to retain the candor of innocence and purity of one's habits amid those who are evil. The other maiden rose to her feet and standing beside her companion said, Blessed is the boy who doesn't heed the counsel of the godless, who doesn't walk in the way of the sinner, but who delights in the commandments of the Lord, contemplating them day and night. He shall be like a tree planted beside the river where the water of God's grace flows, and which shall, in its good time, 
yield the abundant fruit of good works. The leaves of his holy intentions and his merit shall not fall before the blowing of the wind, and all that he shall do shall be successful. In all circumstances of his life, he shall work to enhance his reward. The first maiden answered, He is like a lily amid the thorns, which God shall pluck in his garden to wear as an ornament over his heart. So saying, she pointed to a great cluster of beautiful lilies that lifted their candid heads amid the grass and other flowers, and also to a tall hedge in the distance that surrounded the gardens with greenery. This hedge was thick with thorns, and beyond it, one could perceive horrible monsters moving around like shadows, trying to get inside the garden. It's true, how much truth there is in your words, the other girl said. Blessed is the boy who shall be found without sin, for he has done wondrous things in his life. He was found to be perfect, and shall have glory in eternity. He could sin and did not, he could have done wrong, but did not. For this the Lord has prepared his reward, and his good deeds shall be celebrated by all the congregations of saints. And what great glory God has in store for them here on earth, the first said. The second rose to her feet now and exclaimed, Who could describe the beauty of the innocent? His soul moves lightly along its journey toward eternity. Before him there is a path spangled with stars. The innocent is a living tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. The blood of Jesus runs through his veins, staining crimson his cheeks and lips. All around him sweet melodies are heard, and the angels echo the prayer of his soul. The Most Holy Mary is at his side, ready to defend him. Heaven stands open for him. The infinite legions of the saints and of the blessed spirits stand ranged before him, inviting him to advance by waving their palms. In the inaccessible radiance of his throne of glory, God lifts his right hand to indicate the place prepared for him, while in his left he holds the magnificent crown with which he shall be crowned forever. The innocent is the desire, the joy, and the pride of paradise. An ineffable joy is engraved on his countenance. He is the Son of God. God is his Father. Paradise is his heritage. He is constantly with God. He sees him, loves him, serves him, possesses him, enjoys him, and possesses a range of heavenly delights. He is in possession of all treasures, all graces, all secrets, all gifts, all perfections, and the whole of God himself. That's why the innocence of the saints, and especially of the martyrs in the Old and New Testament, is depicted so gloriously. O oh, innocence, how beautiful you are! Tempted, you grow in perfection. Humiliated, you soar even higher. Embattled, you emerge triumphant. When slain, you soar toward your crown. You're free in slavery, serene and certain in peril, happy when in chains. The mighty bow before you. Princes hail you. The great do seek you. The pious obey you. The evil envy you. Your rivals emulate you and your enemies succumb before you. Always shall you be victorious, even when men shall condemn you unjustly. The two little maidens were silent for a moment, as if to take a breath after this impassioned rhapsody. Then they took each other by the hand, exchanged glances, and spoke again in turn. Oh, if only the young knew how precious is the treasure of innocence— how jealously would they defend the stole of holy baptism from the beginning of their days? But alas, they don't reflect, and don't know what it means to soil it. Innocence is a most precious nectar, but it is contained in a jar of fragile clay, and unless one carries it with great care, it's easily broken. Innocence is a most precious jewel, but if one is unaware of its value, it can be lost, and will easily be transformed into base metal. Innocence is a golden mirror which reflects the likeness of God, yet a breath of humid air is enough to make it rusty, and one must needs keep it wrapped in a veil. Innocence is a lily, yet a mere touch from a rough hand will wither it. Innocence is a candid garment. May your garment be always white. Yet a single blemish will defile it, so one must proceed with great caution. 
Innocence and integrity are violated if soiled only by one stain, and will lose the treasure of grace. Only one mortal sin is enough, and once lost, it's lost forever. What a tragedy it is that so many lose their innocence in one single day. When a boy falls victim to sin, paradise closes its doors, the Blessed Virgin and his guardian angel disappear, music is silent, light fades away, God will no longer be in his heart, the star-spangled path he was following vanishes, he falls and will linger like an island in the midst of the sea, in one single place. A sea of fire will extend to the furthest horizon of eternity, falling down into the abyss of chaos. Over his head, in the darkly menacing sky, flash the lightning flares of divine justice. Satan has hastened to join him, and loads him now with chains. He places a foot upon his neck, and raising his horrible countenance toward the sky, he shouts, I have won! Your son is now my slave. He's no longer yours. Joy is over for him. If, in his justice, God then removes from beneath him that one little place where he's standing, he'll be lost forever. Yet he may rise again. The mercy of God is infinite. A good confession will restore grace to him and his title as the Son of God, but not his innocence. And what consequences will linger on in him after that initial sin? He is now aware of the sin of which he had no knowledge previously. Terrible will be the evil inclinations he will experience. He will feel the terrible debt he has contracted toward divine justice and will find that he is now weaker in his spiritual battles. He will feel that which he had never felt before. Shame, sadness, remorse. To think that previously it was said of him, Let the little children come unto me. They will be like God's angels in heaven. My son, give me your heart. Ah, those wretches who are guilty for the loss of innocence in a child, they commit a hideous crime. Jesus said, Whoever shall give scandal to any of these little ones who believe in me, it would have been better if he had put a millstone around his neck and drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe unto the world because of scandal. It's not possible that scandal be prevented but woe unto him who is guilty of it. Beware lest you despise any of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven see constantly the face of my Father who is in heaven, and who demands vengeance. Wretched indeed are they, but no less wretched are those who permit them to steal their innocence. Then they both began to stroll up and down, talking about how innocence could be preserved. And if you'd like to hear their words of advice, Please come back Wednesday because I've totally run out of time today. Thank you all so much for watching. God bless you and Our Lady keep you.